Okay, I guess we should get started. Thank you to everybody for coming for this festive and special event for Mita Karimi Defense. So, um, I guess to introduce it briefly. So I wanted to just start off with the formal stuff. So for those of you who don't know, this is Mita's background. So she got a, a BS in Plant Ecology from uh, Evergreen State College. And then uh, she had, she worked for a few years uh, doing ecologically related work. So she worked for a time as program manager in habitat restoration. Uh, and I don't know where the Cedar River watershed is, but somewhere out west. Uh, Seattle. Yeah, Seattle. Okay. And then she came back to Wisconsin, from the native of the Milwaukee area, to come back and work um, as the invasive plant protection coordinator um, for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. So what happened was she she was in that job, and I guess she decided she she should go get a PhD. Um, she came here, and I remember very vividly when she first dropped by my office for a meeting. Uh, she, she came in, she was extremely professional, let's just say. I mean, she had <laughs> everything laid out, had everything to have, me, all the paperwork, she was thinking about asking great questions. Somebody really kind of is organized and is a professional in the field. It's very obvious right then. So, um, so around that time, she was talking about, uh, she was really interested in systematics, she hasn't done a lot of systematics, I'd say, but she was interested in, in systematics and phylogenetics, uh, had a very strong ecology background, uh, and interest in, at that time, if I remember right, Anacardiaceae, maybe, what? later moved into Juniper, into anyway. I love all of this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, it so happened that I got this grant from the National Science Foundation, and I had a uh, position on it. I was like, you know, it would be great to have someone who would be really organized, uh, hardworking, would get stuff done. And Lisa was the obvious person of people in there at that point. So I was very, very happy when she joined us uh, in January 2014, uh, just shy of five years ago. So, um, so she's done a lot of things while she's been here. She's got the uh, awards, um, very well earned awards. She got her first three doctoral fellowship. Uh, then she added on to that this very interesting award um, from, US, from NSF, but connected with USAID, where she actually took her research in the field and had to have an impact on development, in this case on fruit collection uh, and uh, seed collection for economic purposes in, in South Africa. So um, I got very, you know, she's done a lot of field work. Um, so this is in Madagascar, collecting bear baths. This is in South Africa, doing pollination in the village, getting a lot of attention. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, some trees are too tall to, uh, to do the step ladder for. So uh, one of the things she got good at was tree climbing, putting ropes up in trees and climbing them at night to take, in, take pictures of, and observe pollination behavior. Uh, and then of course, once you've got them, you've got to do analysis. You've got to somehow, in uncomfortable conditions, uh, do science. Uh, which she does tremendously well. Um, of course, getting around in the tropics can be sort of, they can, travel itself can be a bit of an adventure at times, um, rough, but one thing you'll see, she's extremely uh, tough and relaxed and easygoing in the field. So I had the pleasure to spend a couple, a couple of weeks in Madagascar with Nisa, and you know, she really is just easy, easy, really great field biologist, really easy in, in that concept setting. Doesn't get stressed, doesn't get upset. So that was, enjoyed that a lot. Um, so um, I think you all know she's been very productive. So, um, <laughs> but in addition to Winston, uh, she's actually had a, but has done very well uh, for herself. She uh, helped with this paper on pollination. Uh, she's co-first author on a paper that kind of set straight the, uh, the nomenclature and taxonomy of the African species, uh, showed that there was not a second species that was been claimed. Um, she's also co-first author on a recent paper uh, on uh, mallow, uh, the broad-scale genome evolution, and she even got a, a paper in on um, a paper on a curricular paper, teaching-based paper. Um, based on her experiences as a TA in 152. So, um, and I think she's got some future papers coming up, and she's got the uh, uh, postdoc lined up at the, at the Walton Arboretum. So, <clears throat> so what, I, what I was thinking about really what has struck me most about Nita, it really is her ability to learn new things 
So I came in and I said, you know, truthfully, she didn't know a lot of systematic uh, when she came. Somehow, while she'd been here, she had acquired expertise in an incredible range of fields. And I actually wrote a list, it's probably a partial list, it's a partial list. Tree climbing, pollination experiments, pollen tube staining, chromosome, uh, uh, chromosome staining and counting, genome size estimation, floral stem connection, genome assembly, gene tree inference, population tree inference, phylogenetic inference, scripting and bioinformatics, microsatellite scoring, admixture analysis, parentage inference, nectar and sugar amino acid analysis, and gas chromatography mass spectrometry, which isn't bad. <laughs> and, and one more skill she has acquired, which not many people have, is speaking with babies. Uh, she somehow can have a meaning or give a seminar with Winston here, which is really takes tremendous concentration. So, um, so, so basically, um, at this point, I want to say personally, congratulations, Lisa. Uh, I am gonna, I, I'm going to miss you, but I'm only going to be around for a few months, which is great. Uh, so we can take this to work on. So, uh, so uh, congratulations everybody, please welcome. Nearly Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. of the baobabs and their, the evolution of their incredible floral diversity. And so all across their range, the baobabs are iconic and strongly associated with human settlements as seen here. So where often when there is a village, there is often a resident baobab tree. All parts of the tree can be used with nearly a hundred different purposes documented. The fruit make a great snack. Uh, they, it, the, it's also made into juice or porridge. Uh, the leaves can be steamed and eaten as a green. The um, seeds are grown for the roots, the tap root to be eaten, um, stripped and eaten. The inner fibers um, of the bark are also used to make rope for either houses or baskets um, uh, for other purposes. And all across their range, they are considered sacred. And there is a lot of folklore associated with these trees. And it's not surprising why. So these trees are massive. This tree in particular is one of the largest trees in Africa. It's found in South Africa, and it has a circumference of nearly 33 meters. So these trees are dominant on the landscape, and they exist for thousands of years. And so if you can just imagine the stories that one individual tree must hold. And so when I refer to the baobabs, I was referring to a genus of eight species seen here, the genus Adansonia in the family Melvaceae. So all eight of these species have incredible floral diversity. These are massive flowers, and they have to be, if you think about that they can produce fruit um, this large or even larger. And there, there's two pollination fields in this group, which we'll talk about later, uh, mammal pollinated and hawk moth pollinated. And they all share um, this interesting biology. So all of these species are nocturnally pollinated, and they are only receptive for one night. And so what that means is that you can often find, you'll often see in the late afternoon, the calyx cracking, which indicates which flower is going to open that evening. As the sun is setting, these flowers will begin to open. And then by early the next morning, these flowers are already wilting and falling from the trees. And so if you're out early in the morning, it is literally raining baobab flowers. In the African baobab, this process of the flower opening takes anywhere between 30 minutes to about an hour. In many of the Madagascar species, it is much faster. So these flowers are actually about a foot long, and they can literally peel, the calyx peels back and will literally spring open in a matter of seconds. 
That is not my video. That's planet Earth. <laughs> So the genus has a very interesting biogeographical pattern. There's one species from found widespread across continental Africa. There is one species endemic to the remote northwest part of Australia. And then the center of diversity is in Madagascar, with tra traditionally six species recognized there. Now, because I'm going to be talking about each individual species in such great detail, I want to introduce you to each one. Uh, one by one here. So the African baobab is probably the wolf most well known, um, perhaps from cultural references, from the movie The Lion King, uh, or the child's um, story The Little Prince. Um, and these species, this species in particular, um, is considered can be considered a, a keystone species, and so they provide extensive um, food and habitat for for um, a lot of wildlife. In Australia, the, uh, the baobab there is referred to as the boab. And again, it's endemic to the remote northwest part of Australia in the Kimberley region. While it is probably the least known, it's as easily just as conic um, in that part of the world. They're equally as large, um, and they have been used historically for various, various reasons. In this photograph here, it was uh, that tree in particular was used as a holding cell. Um, and they have these beautiful white flowers seen here that are classic hawk moth pollinated. So then that leads us with the six species in Madagascar. So previous work designated the six species in Madagascar into two sections based on floral morphology. And so I'm going to refer to these two sections quite often. So the first section is Brevetufe. It's comprised of a pair of Aleph Patrick species. And it's named such because of the short staminal tubes. So Breve meaning short in Latin, uh, referring to these short staminal tubes on the flower. So both of these species have very similar um, canopy architecture. The species here, Grand Didieri, is probably the most well-known uh, because of its, um, um, probably the most well-known in Madagascar because of this avenue of baobabs they refer to it as. But equally, I would say, as striking is the species Suarezensis on the right-hand side, which is restricted um, in the far northern part of the island seen here. Both of these species share similar floral morphology, um, so it doesn't take a botanist to see that these, I think, that these flowers <laughs> look um, quite similar. Um, so they both have these uh, erect, pale flowers. They have a calyx that's brown on the exterior, as seen here. The interior of the calyx is a cream colored, and it almost um, is shaped like a cup, and it exposes nectar to visiting pollinators. Um, these are, um, and they also have oh, white petals and a white style, as you can see in both of those here. So these are the mammal pollinated um, species in Madagascar. They are visited by both lemurs um, and bats. And both of these species flower in the dry season when these trees are leafless. <coughs> the four species that make up the section longitude are seen here. And again, this section is named such based on the elongated staminal tube, which is most pronounced in this species here, Perrieri. I'll mention now that this color coding is consistent throughout my talk, so, so you can start putting colors to, um, to species names here. So all four of these species are hawk moth pollinated. They range in color, uh, the flowers range in color with petals from a pale yellow, a pure pale yellow, to a deeper yellow, yellow with these orange striations, um, sometimes <coughs> almost pure orange, and then <coughs> strikingly red in the species Madagascariensis. Uh, all four of these species have a calyx that is green on the exterior, um, and the interior <coughs> is pink, more or less. And they all have this red style, which I think you can see best here in the picture of Zaw. So previous work in this group was unable to resolve the relationship between these four species. 
So now let me just walk through each individual one in a little bit more detail because of that in particular. So the species Ruber stipa, I would consider perhaps iconic to the dry spiny forests in the south. Uh, but this species does also, um, is reported to occur in these two populations in, in more than northern part of the island. There are two derived traits that distinguish this species. And so these are two characters that are unique to this um, species. One being the serrated leaf edges, and the other being in relation to the flower, where it has stamens that are fused from the center part of the scamble tube. Species Madagascariensis consider is the only species that has flowers with these red petals seen here. And I would consider the, the classic fruit, fruit shape being globos. Here's an example. Um, but this is not diagnostic. In particular, as you travel through the southern part of the range, there can be a lot of differences in fruit shape. This species is unique, however, in that it does have fall flowering. Um, so no, no other species um, <coughs> flowers at that time. Uh, I forgot to mention one thing. There are also rare populations of yellow flowered Madagascariensis, and that will be important a little bit later in the talk. So, the next species, Perrieri, is probably the most endangered out of all of the species. It's uh, restricted to the subhumid forests in the far no north. They're only known from a handful of populations, and it's estimated that there's some near 200 trees left in the wild. They have the most pronounced stamenal tube as seen here. And these species are, um, in addition to being sort of generally pollinated by hawk moss, they are also visited by the famous Darwin hawk moth. So if we know the story, there's an orchid in Madagascar that has this extremely long nectar spur. Darwin hypothesized that there must be a hawk moth with a proboscis long enough to reach the end of that nectar spur. And indeed, 20 years later, this hawk moth was um, described, and that species has been seen um, visiting Perrieri. Za is the most widespread of the species across the island, seen here. It's worth mentioning that although this distribution map makes it look like the distribution is continuous, it's perhaps not, and whether that be um, natural disjunct populations or from habitat fragmentation, I can't really say. Um, but this species has incredible floral diversity, which I've summarized here. So today, those are the species. Today, I'm going to utilize phylogenomics at two different scales. So this part talk is going to be organized into two different sessions. So first, we're going to look at the genus level patterns in order to infer what the evolution of this incredible floral diversity is in this group and what is the biogeographical history. The second part of my talk, we're going to focus on more population level analyses in order to assess gene flow between traditionally delimited species. And so first, let's just focus on some of the broad scale questions. So what is the relationship between the three geographic lineages, between Australia, Madagascar, and, Australia, and Africa? And then once we've developed um, a, a hypothesis of these relationships, can we, can we infer the evolution of floral diversity and pollination systems in this group? So before I get into the, to the details, um, I want to make sure that everybody in the room can at least read a very general phylogenetic tree because I'm going to be utilizing them so much. And so phylogenies are a way to depict genealogical relationships. You can think about them as a family tree. So in this scenario, these two maples are more closely related to each other than they are to these two maples. We refer to these two maples as sister to each other. And if you travel back in time, you will find a point where they share a common ancestor, as seen here. However, if you travel back in time far enough, you'll reach the point where, where these two maples and these maples share a common ancestor. And then you can also employ phylogenomics at more of a population level, which I'm depicting here. So if you think about each individual is made up of a genome, and within that genome, there are many, many genes. 
each with its own evolutionary history. And if you select any one gene from the genome, it's possible that the gene tree or the gene phylogeny would not give you this same relationship. So the genes and any one gene may not agree with each other. And so this phenomenon we refer, we refer to as a gene tree, species tree discordance. And this, um, I don't have time to go into this in great detail, but this is important for today. So I at least wanted to introduce it. So we have a situation where the population tree, um, uh, well, otherwise referred to as the species tree, suggests that these two maples share a common ancestor here. But if you pick any one gene at random, it may tell a different story as indicated here. And so one way to combat this issue, or to, in order to summarize across the uncertainty of gene trees, you can utilize genomic scale data for hundreds of genes. And so we did just that using a targeted sequence capture approach. And so this approach allows you to selectively target subsets of the genome. So in this case, the genome that's closest, that's most closest related to the baobabs that's available is cotton. And so utilizing the available cotton genome, we sequenced transcriptomes from a baobab and a close relative. You can map the transcriptome back to the genome in order to identify target regions of the genome that you want to sequence. And so with that, we were able to identify near 400 genes of interest. And so the analyses that we're going to present on today are um, over 300 genes. So once you have this genomic scale data, you can now develop a phylogeny, which will serve as your hypothesis for the relationships between these species or the evolutionary history. So that's what I'm showing you here. And so this is a Bayesian concordance analysis present, uh, developed or utilized with Bucky. And so this represents a population tree. So it's a dominant history of the population, of the ancestral population. And on the edges, I'm showing you concordance factors. And so that is a value that represents the percentage of the genes or the percentage of the genome that give you that clade. Now, the way this works is Bucky utilizes quartets. So it utilizes four taxon subsets. And so if you were randomly to select out of the possible topologies of a four taxon set, any one topology would occur one third of the time. And then you can take that one step further and actually summarize uh, 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 incredibility intervals to understand how this relationship of gene trees is distributed across the genome. Okay, so that's important when we look at these concordance factors. So in particular, the relationship between the Australian lineage and the African lineage um, has a concordance factor of 0.36. Now, this is actually um, insignificant. Um, it, it basically means that the relationship between the Australian lineage and that to Africa and Madagascar is unresolved. And the reason why is because there was conflicting concordance factors through all possible topologies. In contrast, however, this, um, that we're finding that there's monophyly of the, of the species of Madagascar. So about 50% of the genome um, are represented to have this clade. And so what this suggests is that perhaps there was a single dispersal event to Madagascar, and then these species um, radiated. If we go down one step further, we're now seeing non-monophyly of the longitubi taxa. So these are those four species that have yellow flowers that are hawk moth pollinated. And embedded within, we're seeing the section brevitube. This concordance factor here, so in contrast to what I explained earlier about having these, by having um, um, unresolved topologies of these lineages, this concordance factor here had no alternative topology. And so although it's small, this we do believe is indicative of the true evolutionary history. Another important takeaway from this phylogeny here is the non-monophyly of the species za. So seen here and seen here. 
So if we look at the plastid tree, so the plastid tree, so the plastome is an organelle that is maternally inherited. And so it, it can often be the source of gene tree disorders in, in, um, when you compare it to the nuclear tree. But it can also be evidence of potential patterns of gene flow that were undetected in the nuclear genome. And so what we're seeing here is non-monophyly of the section brevetube. And although I don't have time to go into it today, we performed a series of statistical tests by, uh, by simulating gene trees given the phylogeny, and it suggests that this topology could have arose via incomplete lineage sorting. In contrast, however, now we're seeing monophyly of the section longitube seen here. So we have Ruber stippa in the on the nuclear phylogeny, it was uh, sister to the rest of the Maliasi species, and here it's embedded within longitube. And again, we're seeing non-monophyly of um, the species saw. Now, given this, um, so again, those four um, species of longitube suggest there's a complicated history. But even still, we feel fairly confident that the nuclear phylogeny is indeed representative of the true evolutionary history of the populations. And so given that, we can use this as our hypothesis to explain observed floral homoplasies in the group. And so we, if the ancestral to the baobabs are all white, we would infer that the ancestral baobab would be a white flower population. And then perhaps subsequently there was a transition from white flowered to yellow flowered on the edge of leading to the Madagascar species, and a subsequent transition from yellow to white on the um, <coughs> ancestor of the Greta Tube lineage. Alternatively, there could have been two independent transitions from white flower to yellow flower. So on the edge leading to the Ruber stipple lineage here, and on the edge leading to what I'll now refer to as the core longitube seen here. But there's another hypothesis, even still, to explain this. It's possible that the ancestors of these two lineages could have hybridized. And with that hybridization, there could have been um, some exchange of genes that um, resulted in these very similar floral traits. And so using our nuclear data, we can actually test for hybridization using a program called SNAP in the Phylo Network's passing package. And what we found was quite surprising, it was unexpected, but it makes sense biologically. And so what we found, there was evidence for a hybridization event from the ancestor of the African baobab into the lineage of the Malagasy Brevetube. And so it's possible that with this hybridization event, uh, there could have been this transition in floral characters and pollination syndromes. And so given this hybridization network, we can statistically test the probability of how plausible is it that these traits were carried with this hybridization edge. And so you can do this using an ancestral state reconstruction, which I'm showing you here. Yeah. So we utilize this approach on both flower color and also uh, pollination systems. Because the results were compatible, I'm just showing you color here. And I'm, I've included the pollination systems on the side. So here you have the taxon names. You have their current or the extant population's flower color. And then on the right-hand side, I've included the current pollination systems. And so what this um, is showing you is it's showing you the probabilities on the interior nodes, the probability of the, the, pro the probability of what the ancestral population was. And so on this, it's suggesting that it's more likely that the ancestral population was a white-flowered uh, population. And as I mentioned, this was compatible results with pollination systems, which also suggested that the ancestor was hawk moth pollinated. And so then, it was, it's showing that with that hybridization edge, almost near simultaneously, there, it's probable that there would have been a shift in flower color and pollination system. So 
So if you think about this, given that the ancestor to the, it's suggested that the ancestor to the Malagasy lineage was a yellow flowered hot moth pollinated population. And so what this is suggesting is that a white flower mammal pollinated um, um, individual hybridized or population hybridized with this ancestral um, hawk moth pollinated population. And while this may seem unlikely, we have evidence already in this group that there suggests that there may be some labiality in pollination systems. And so in particular, in the section Brevetube that's predominantly um, pollinated by lemurs and also fruit bats, we've also observed hawk moths foraging. These species, Gregorii in Australia, is considered a classic hawk moth pollinated species. And there's new evidence that shows that fruit bats um, are indeed visiting these trees and also pollinating them as well. Then within Africa, the African baobab is a classic bat pollinated species. They have all of the, the traits associated with bat pollination. But there's now evidence to suggest that these trees, at least in some part of their range, are being pollinated by hawk moths. So in particular, in South Africa, collaborators there have never observed bats foraging on these trees, yet they produce abundant amounts of fruit. And so to further get at this question, we performed nocturnal observations. We conducted a series of pollinator exclusion experiments. And then we also analyzed floral scent profiles in collaboration with Kenki Overring. And what we found was that in the absence of bats, hawk moths are taking over the role of pollination. Hawk moths are serving as the dominant pollinator in South Africa. What's even more interesting is that the floral profiles of these trees in South Africa contain abundant amount of a compound a sesquiterpene, which is common in hawk moth pollinated species. And what's even more interesting is that previous research has been done in Senegal, a classic bat pollinated population, and they found none of these compounds in those floral profiles there. So this suggests that there may be some continental scale differences in pollination systems. Okay, so there could, so it's possible then that the hybridization between the, the, between the ancestor of the African baobab and the ancestor of the Brevetube could explain this evolution um, in floral characters and pollination systems. And so that is what, we've, what I'm summarizing for the first part of this talk. But there is a lingering question here. So we found non monophyly of the section longitubi with this nuclear plastid discordance. And so we need to investigate that a little bit further. And so just a reminder of some of the, some of the key players that have been difficult to distinguish is this species of the core longitubi. So superficially, these species look like sort of classically delimited species, but there is a lot of variability in them. So, um, I as I mentioned, there's a lot of differences in fruit shape, and particularly as you travel through the southern part of the range, and there's a lot of variability in jaw. And it can be quite difficult to distinguish all three of these species when they're not in flower. And so, for the second part of this talk now, I'm going to focus on these questions. So, are the core longitude species indeed distinct entities? So it's been previously hypothesized that those three species actually represent more of a species complex. Um, and then we're gonna focus on if we're able to develop a hot hypothesis for species diversification in Madagascar. And so in order to do this, um, as David said, we traveled to Madagascar and we sampled broadly across each species ranges, which is shown here. So the analyses I'm going to show you are with a collection of 56 samples from all six species. And there's a two notable um, gaps in my sampling scheme here. So the species Zaw is found um, in the southernmost part of the island here that we were unable to collect from. And then Ruber Stepa does, um, or is said to have populations up in here that we were unable to collect from. But in addition to, to our 56 samples, we were able to include um, um, 
a, a special case study, if you will. So our collaborator um, described or claimed that there was a new species of baobab found. And so they collected this sample in a population at the range interface of Madagascariensis and Rubristipa. The morphology didn't quite fit either species, and so we're including that um, um, in our sampling strategy. And so now what I'm showing you again is the nuclear phylogeny. So in contrast with before, um, where I had concordance factors on the edges, this is a population tree that actually that, that has support values. So it's this, it's the the, the support um, or the, the probability that of that claim arising. And so what I've done here is I've color coded the samples based on species designations, um, and then provided the support values for each of those primary clades. And the takeaway here is that for each primary clade that's color-coded, it has um, a strong support value of one. And this nuclear phylogeny is consistent with the phylogeny I showed you earlier, in that Rubristipa is sister to the rest of the Madagascar species, and then Brevetube is sister uh, to the core Longitube. Our um, putative new species is showing up here, indicated by the star, and it is found as sister to the rest of the Rubrostipa. So the most interesting um, thing that arose is again we're seeing non-monophyly of, of the species saw. And we're having a clade of samples from the north and a clade of samples from the south. Now this can actually, this is actually consistent with mor morphological observations that were described many years ago. And so there's this interesting geographical variation in ZA, where you have populations in the north were pre previously designated as a variety of, um, of ZA, because they have fruit shape that has these very narrow peduncles, as shown in the photograph here, and leaflets that are sessile. In contrast, populations in the south, these very swollen pedicles uh, and, and um, leaflets that extend on these long pedicles. However, the systematic revision of this group suggested that these traits were too uh, continuous to designate varieties. Now, we are, um, so, we, so we see there's sort of a geographical pattern um, that's occurring. And so as a way to further visualize potential geographic structure that we may not be able to see just from the phylogeny, we utilize a population level approach using um, the program structure. So structure typically takes single nucleotide polymorphism data, um, and in contrast, we have these full uh, sequence data. And so what we did is utilizing all of our gene trees, we extracted clade membership for each sample coded them as presence or absence in that clade, and then we utilize that genotype matrix as input into structure. And so on the bottom, what I'm showing you here is a summary of the nuclear phylogeny, and then I'm, on the top I'm showing you the structure plot. And what this is showing is that there is a clear genotype distinction based on species, so the color coded match, with two notable exceptions. So the populations of the northernmost ZA are indicated here, and they're actually an admixture of the southern ZA populations, the Perrieri, and the Madagascariensis. And our putative new species that was found as sister to the rest of River Stippa is actually now showing up as being an admixed genotype from the Ruber Stippa and a portion coming from Madagascariensis. So this actually suggests that this individual is a hybrid between these two lineages. And so again, using SNAP, we can test for this hybridization. And what we found was that indeed this individual is coming up as a hybrid. And so 80% of the genome, genome or 80% of the genes analyzed come from the Rubrostipa lineage, and about 20% of the genes are coming from the Madagascariensis lineage. Now, unfortunately, we, have, we don't have any other samples from that part of Madagascar from either species, 
So it's unclear if this is just um, a, um, an individual or if there is indeed a whole population of ethnic individuals up there. And what is the extent of gene flow between these two species? We can't really say at this point. Now, things get even a little bit more complicated in terms of gene flow when we look at the plastid tree, which I'm showing you here. So, um, in the bottom right hand side here, I'm showing you a summary of the nuclear population tree. And then the, the plastid tree is again um, color coded. So, let me start at the bottom. So, now we're showing monophyly of the brevitubic being sister to all of the longitubic. Then, there is a clade of the southern Za and the southern Madagascariensis. That hybrid individual has, um, is showing up as sister to the southern Madagascariensis, so suggesting that it um, um, had captured the Madagascariensis plastid with that hybridization event. There is a clade of Rubristipa with Za embedded within, suggesting there was some hybridization or gene flow events there. And then there is a clade of the northern Za periary and the northernmost Madagascariensis. This northern southern distinction can be um, geographically delimited by the Samburino River. So the Samburino has previously been shown to act as a barrier to gene flow, either the because of the river itself restricting gene flow or because it creates a climatic region that is unsuitable. And so I've sort of very um, quickly shown you that there's a lot of evidence of gene flow between traditionally diluted species. So now I'm going to walk you through a hypothesis of diversification of the baobabs in Madagascar. And so on the left hand side here, I'm going to show you a summary of the nuclear population tree. And then on the bottom, I'm showing you the plastid tree. So we believe there was an initial, an initial dispersal event to Madagascar. Then the Rubristipa uh, lineage diverged from the ancestral population. Perhaps at some point it involved these serratic leaf edges and these changes in floral structure that I mentioned earlier. The ancestor to the brevitube and the longitube separated, and as I showed you, perhaps we could hypothesize that there was a second dispersal event into Madagascar that hybridized with the brevitube, aiding in that shift in um, floral traits and pollination systems. The southern populations of Za emerge, and then the northern um, core longitubi, or the ancestor to the northern core longitubi, expands northwards. These populations continue to grow, and perhaps the ancestor of the periary adapts to these subhumid forests in the north. And we can also hypothesize that perhaps it evolves this elongated staminal tube in response to the xanthopan uh, Darwin hawk moth. Then the ancestor to the Madagascariensis and the northern populations of Za diverge as seen here. Perhaps Madagascariensis then switches to fall flowering and acquires these red petaled flowers. And at some point, given the plastid tree, there was gene flow between um, these three entities in the north. There's also evidence to suggest gene flow between the southern populations of Madagascariensis and the southern Za. And we also have evidence to suggest, given the plastid tree, that the uh, rubra stipa and populations in Za also exchanged genes at some point. So this is a rather complicated, uh, yes, and then of course, to explain our hybrid individual, um, we know that there was some gene flow, um, at least between these two lineages in this part of the island. But again, we don't have sampling from populations there to really assess the extent at which, at which um, this is occurring. So in summary, despite extensive gene flow, as I hope to have shown you between these lineages, 
Traditional taxonomy is still supported with the exception of Adansonia za. So if we, if we sort of revive our varietal names of za and switch these northern populations to the varietal designation, um, perhaps changing its name to Adansonia boozy, then um, these traditional taxonomic distinctions do hold true. And I think it is important to end on the importance of phylogenomics in this day and age. So using a phylogenomic approach, we are finally able to develop a hypothesis for diversification in Madagascar. And this will hopefully be critical for future taxonomic and conservation implications. So I have a number of people to thank. Um, for this work, most notably uh, my advisor David Baum for not only sharing his knowledge and passion for the baobab trees and also uh, assisting me in field work in Madagascar, um, but being a great mentor um, to me and baby Winston. There are a, um, a number of number of people that um, um, that I have to thank, including my co-authors. Um, of course, my committee, a number of people that have supported this project in one way or another, um, a number of people in the botany department that assisted with helping me grow baobabs or improving my graphics, um, a number of stellar undergraduate researchers have been um, instrumental in, in helping um, um, see this project through. Within the field, this couldn't be done alone, so there's probably hundreds of people in the field um, that have helped me collect in both um, Madagascar, Tanzania, and South Africa. And because surely I forgot about so many people, thank you to all of you that I'm forgetting, and for baby Winston for being um, so agreeable for letting me take him into the lab at all hours of the day. Um, and with that, um, I will take questions. <laughs>